Division is Divisions. Mr. Garvey? Here. Ms. Holloway? Here. Dr. Jones? Here. Ms. Lewis? I'm here. Ms. Orange Jones? Mr. Roth? Dr. Thomason? Here. Ms. Voshe? And Ms. Georgia Hill? Here. All right, you have a quorum. Thank you. Do I need to take a mo do I need to have a motion to take things out of order, or can I just take them out of order? Um, we will when we get to that. When we get to the items, okay, that sounds good. Um, what is our first item? Your consent agenda is ready for your approval. Adding items 4.1, 4.2, and 4.3. I need a motion. I have a motion from Miss Orange Jones and a second from Miss Holloway. Is there any objection? Hearing none, motion carries. What's our next item? Your first item is on page one, item 2.1, consideration of a report regarding waiver requests submitted by local education agency, agencies for the 2018-2019 school year regarding policy contained in Bulletin 741, Louisiana Handbook for School Administrators, Section 2313, Elementary Program of Studies, pertaining to Bessie mandated elementary level foreign language programs as submitted by the State Superintendent of Education. The recommendation is to receive the waiver request from St. Bernard, St. Mary, and West Feliciana Parishes. Is there a motion? Move. So by moved by Mr. Garvey and a second by? Dr. Thomason, thank you very much. Um, board members, do you have any questions about this? No. Nope. Do we have any public comment? Not on this item. On this item. Okay. Um, I don't know. I see St. Bernard is here. I don't know if you have to just note that um, Ms. Foche is not in attendance, that she would recuse herself, I'm sure, if she wasn't here. All right. Um, any objection? Hearing none, what's our next item? Your next item is on page five, item 2.2, consideration of an LEA request from St. James Parish School System for a waiver of policy contained in Bulletin 1706, regulations for the implementation of the Children with Exceptionalities Act for the 2018-2019 school year, submitted by the State Superintendent of Education. The department recommendation is to approve the waiver request regarding the Scholastic Academy for St. James Parish School Systems with contingencies. So we have a motion by Ms. Orange Jones and a second by Ms. Holloway. Do we have any public comment cards on this item? No, ma'am. None? Board members, do you have any questions? No. Do you have any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 7, item 3.1, consideration of the reauthorization of successful course choice providers and a status report regarding course choice providers. The department recommendation is to approve the reauthorization of the identified course choice providers and to receive the course choice provider status report. Corrected backup, backup documentation has been distributed. Board members, we need a motion to approve and receive. Ms. Orange Jones, thank you very much. A second by Mr. Garvey. Do we have comment cards on this item? No, ma'am. Okay. Now we're going to take them out of order. Ms. Bindley, um, it said there's also like a receiver report. Is there anything in particular we should note from the department? Uh, we're on the one, the reauthorization of successful course choice providers and a status report regarding course choice providers. So I guess I just want to make sure. Okay, the report is in our documentation and we are covered. Board members, do you have any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. Now we want to, we're actually going to do 3.3, um, but I want to skip 3.2 and come back to it later. So a motion to take out of order. Board members, I need a motion to take uh, 3.2 out of order. Okay, um, that is a motion by Ms. Holloway and a second by Mr. Garvey. So we will go ahead and skip to item 3.3 .3 now. Your next item is on page 12, item 3.3, .3, consideration of the renewal of previously approved state certified world language immersion schools. The department recommendation is to approve the renewals for Frosh Elementary, Mamu Elementary, and Prairie Elementary schools. Board members, um, a motion by Ms. Edmondson and a second by Mr. Rock. Thank you very much. Do we have any comment cards? 
not on this side. No comment cards? Should I take I would, board members, like to take a point of personal privilege. Uh, we have representatives of Mamu Elementary School in Evangeline Parish and Prairie Elementary School in Lafayette Parish that are in attendance. And um, the department has created a certificate recognizing these schools as being newly designated world language immersion programs. We'd like to invite the school representatives to come down for a picture. I'll recognize Ms. Bendeley with the department. Thank you, Ms. Buffy. I just wanted to say, uh, for those who aren't familiar with the certification process for World Language Immersion Schools, it is a very rigorous process. These schools go through quite a bit to, to get ready for this process and to renew it every few years. So this is quite an achievement. We also wanted to let you know that the seal that Ms. Bofi was holding up is actually an image that we email to them that they can use to put, uh, uh, some people put it uh, on their on their letterhead. Uh, it's a seal that shows that they have earned the status of a state certified immersion school. Some actually blow it up and have it affixed to their doors uh, throughout their facilities or put it on a flag. So it's something that they're very proud of. We really, um, we, we just uh, redid the image to update it uh, to a high quality image. So we're very excited that we'll share that with them and they can proudly display it in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd also like to add that Senator LaFleur was here earlier, but we are a little off schedule and he wasn't able Able to, to stay with us, but um, I do want to acknowledge that he was here and is, is a champion for um, uh, world language immersion programs. Did we have any other comments from board members? Any objections? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 22, item 4.4, <coughs> consideration of the membership of the Early Childhood Care and Education Advisory Council and Early Childhood Care and Education Commission. The department recommendation is to 
Approve the appointment of Dr. Michelle Jobert as a Head Start representative on the ECCE Advisory Council and to ratify the Bessie appointments to the Early Childhood Care and Education Commission authorized by Dr. Gary Jones, Bessie President, submitted on July 25, 2018 on behalf of Bessie. Board members, so we need a motion to approve and ratify. Thank you, Ms. Orange-Jones. And a second, Ms. Holloway. Um, do we have any comment cards on this item? No, ma'am. Board members, do you have any questions or concerns about this item? Is there any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 26, item 5.1, consideration of revisions to bulletin 1566, pupil progression policies and procedures, section 503, regular placement relative to student placement. The department recommendation is to approve as emergency rule and notice of intent. Motion. We have a motion by Ms. Holloway and a second by Mr. Rock. Do we have any comment cards on this item? Yes, ma'am. Karen Autis wishes to speak. Please come forward. Sean Fleming and Kristen Reed. Yes, ma'am. Um, emergency room. Miss Edmondson, pull forward okay. your microphone. Yes. Is that better? Um, the emergency rule, can, can you explain that to me? Is that okay? Yes, so the reason that we pass policy for the purpose of emergency rule is so that it'll go into effect now. Immediately. Otherwise, the, um, it has to go through the notice of intent process, which is a rather long process. Right, right. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one will go through both, but it'll be um, okay. active now and then also work it. Okay, thank you. Who would like to go first? I'll go first. Okay. Hi, my name is Kristen Reed. I want to thank each member present for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Kristen Reed and I'm from DeVille, Louisiana. That's in Rapids Parish. I am the proud mother of a nine-year-old. My daughter, Letha, has an IEP. Today is her first day of fifth grade. High stakes testing is very hard for us. I was told at her last year's IEP that LEAP was not going to be keeping her from being promoted to the next grade. Right before testing, I contacted the school to make sure that she was getting her accommodations and was informed that if she didn't pass the LEAP, she would not be promoted unless she met other requirements. So after she failed the LEAP and after completing summer remediation, she was put in the fifth grade. No discussion at any time relating to an IEP meeting to establish individual promotion criteria was held. I have since further reviewed my local pupil progression plan and have serious concerns about conflicts throughout it. For example, on the same page, it states that promotion decisions are to be done by the SBLC for all students with disabilities. And then, but in the previous paragraph, it says that it's an IEP decision. So I am asking Bessie to first revise bulletin 1566 to specify the promotion criteria for students with disabilities and two, to ask the Louisiana Department of Education to provide additional guidance to districts on promotion specifically related to Act 833. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Ms. Artis, is your mic on? No, now it is. Thank okay. you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Karen Artis from St. Tammany Parish. I'm Region 9 Lacan leader. And I'm concerned about the lack of inclusion of Act 833 and pupil progression plans in my region. Uh, these seem to be confusing on multiple levels regarding what grade to implement, what constitutes implementation. If no high stakes testing, then LEAs don't need to consider Act 833 promotion and more. Um, that's just some of the discussion. Both parents and schools don't know that individualized performance criteria is an option. There is no consistency or discussion. As a parent of a child with an exceptionality, I want performance measures that he can demonstrate, not summer remediation. I ask that Bessie revise the policies for student grade promotion to include rules on how certain students with disabilities can be promoted and revise Bulletin 1566 
pupil appraisal plans related to grade promotion for certain students with disabilities as specified by Act 833. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fleming. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Sean Fleming. I'm with Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council. I shared with you. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Yeah. I'll start over again. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I'm Sean Fleming. I'm with the Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council. I share with you all a couple of letters that the, the council sent you in the department requesting that y'all revise Bulletin 1566 to put uh, provisions related to Act 833 of 2014 related to the promotion of students with disabilities um, who are eligible. And another request was for the department to just provide more guidance to schools in this matter. Um, there's also a letter from the department basically saying they don't think it's needed. Um, parents brought this, so, so, so you all know the Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council is a 28 member body that's predominantly parents of kids with disabilities and individuals with developmental disabilities and agency representatives. Um, they had heard reports and they've experienced it themselves and they made this request a month ago. After that request was made, um, and, but prior to me writing this letter, the Governor's Office of Disability Affairs had a conference here in the Claiborne Building. And one of the presentations at that conference was on Act 833. In the letter that's in front of you are a number of uh, misunderstandings and confusions that were shared by local administrators on the provisions related to promotion for students with disabilities. I also have a couple of copies of pupil progression plans. I have one from Rapides, which is where Ms. Reed is from. And if you look at it, it starts off by saying that promotion decisions for all students with disabilities are done by the school building level committee on page 13. If you go to page um, 29, uh, it's actually the next one. I just wanted okay. to include, that was for graduation. I just wanted okay. to include any reference to it. But on page 38, it's the first part of that is correct, but it's confusing. Does the IP team make the determination related to promotion, as the second bullet says, or the third bullet? Does the third bullet rule where the promotion of decisions for all students with disabilities are determined by the school building level committee? I'd also bring you to your attention the Washtenaw Parish Pupil Progression Plan. I want to, I want to bring you, make sure you're all aware, these plans are approved by the department. The department has a template, and the template does have the correct language in it. The department also has guidance on its website that I feel is, is adequately describes what should happen. Still, there's confusion out there. So when I look at um, Rapides, and I, um, they have references, like on page five, which is the second page in this document. It has a reference to the eligibility criteria related to Act 833, but then nothing to do with that information. As you, you flip a few pages, and the reason I keep these pages is like I wanted to keep pages eight and nine together. If you read the top of page nine, the IEP team determines promotion and graduation criteria for any student with a disability. This is repeated through this document. And that is not correct. There's also evidence from parishes w which do have their pupil progression plans accurately stating Act 833 criteria and requirements. There's still confusion about whether the local um, promotion criteria applies or if it's only related to the state promotion criteria, which has been uh, put on hiatus for the last few years. So as a result of this, you know, all the reports that the councils have on this issue, the request is for y'all to revise Bulletin 1566. As I read these pupil progression plans and understand some of where the confusion may be occurring, is you've got a pupil progression plan bulletin but as it relates to students with disabilities who are eligible under Act 833, it's in a whole different bulletin that is actually specific to federal regulations governing the IEP, which is good. It's in there to tell them they have to do stuff if they're eligible, but 
when people write their pupil progression plans, what happens, it tends to happen is they'll say this is all the criteria and then 20 pages later, oh, by the way, this is what you do for kids with disabilities. Something's been getting mixed in the messaging that's going out through that process. The council's made a recommendation that you revise Bulletin 1566, basically put the stuff that's in Bulletin uh, 1706 in there and, um, and then ask the department to just pr to issue more information and guidance on it. I think, with, as I said, the, the information they have on their website is, is great. I don't think it's being utilized. Thank you very much. I'll answer any questions. Thank you, guys. Um, Ms. Bindley, would you like to come up to represent the department? I have a, a couple of questions. Okay. So, Ms. Bindley, I think there's a point of clarification I want to make relative to um, whether or not the department has approved these um, pupil progression plans. Can you uh, give us some context? Sure. Mm -hmm. Many years ago, the law required uh, school districts to submit pupil progression plans to the State Department for approval. However, uh, several years ago, the law changed. They submit to us a copy of their pupil progression plans, but this, the department does not approve these. Mm -hmm. um, they, they send us a, a copy as a courtesy, uh, but we do not approve those. However, if at any time a parent contacts us and they have a problem or they have a question or they feel as though their local pupil progression plan is not in line with the law, we are happy to get on the phone with them, look through that and try to do what we can to assist them with their local school district. We know, you know, th there's a lot in the law, there's a lot in policy to keep track of and so we're happy to help if ever those questions come to our attention. But no, to answer your question, we do not approve those. Okay, I, that's one thing I needed to clear up. Um, board members, do you have other questions for Ms. Bindley or I, I was anyone else? I'm just going to ask Mr. Fleming if you, if you thought that these plans were being approved by the State Department. Uh, they were they were initially. Right. I, I was not aware they you stopped aware approving. That, yeah, none um, was I. And, and yeah. truthfully, now that I know that, that seems to be a problem. Right. Looking at some of the plans. Right. That we discontinued that. Yeah. Um, but I'll actually. My council will probably add that to We do have an Act 833 ad hoc committee that will be meeting uh, beginning next week to make recommendations to really study it further. But um, no, I was not aware, and it, it makes sense now why some of this stuff's right. in here. Because I'm looking at a few of these plans wondering, what are they talking about? Yeah, and, and I would right. just say, uh, Dr. Boffey, that I, I do believe this is a problem. And I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, you know, I, I know that, you know, I've seen pupil progression plans that with misinformation, like does the SBLC committee do it or does the IEP committee do it? And, and you know, and it, it, it could vary, I guess, since we don't approve at the state level, it could vary by what uh, each district wants to do, but in the plan, if it's, you know, kind of erroneous information, one place you say one thing and, and one the other. So who's convening the ad hoc committee? The Louisiana Developmental Disabilities Council. Okay. I mean, they, 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 they made three, um, they took three actions related to this. One was to ask you all to revise the bulletin to just make it clear when you're talking about pupil progression plan, where the students with disabilities fall in into that bulletin. Um, the second one is just to ask the department to just push out more guidance. Um, it has a guidance on its website, but it's not necessarily uh, being understood the same way across the state and the second thing is we're they they're meeting a small group is meeting to just review what's going on related to the implementation because we've been getting a number of uh, reports and Ms. Edmonston uh, that provision that Mr. Fleming spoke about um, is actually in the policy and I know he made a reference a minute ago that we in our response said that we didn't want to do what was requested. It's not that we said we didn't want to. We said it's actually already in the policy. Uh, we didn't think it was uh, necessary to add any anything further to the policy because it is in there. If you read Bulletin 1566, there is a provision there that points them to the bulletin that school systems go to uh, that speaks to students with disabilities. It's Bulletin 1530. And in that section, you see all of Act 833 and all of the language there relative to the promotion of students with disabilities. So we feel like 
you know, this particular item was to deal with students who were coming in from out of state or transferring from a private school or approved home study program. Uh, the issue of promotion with students with disabilities is already addressed and has been for some time in that bulletin. However, I, you know, I wasn't aware of some of the issues that the parents described. Right. Um, if, if those come to our attention, we're happy to facilitate any discussions with those districts to make sure that if there is any misunderstanding as to how, you know, some recent policy decisions in this bulletins for students who do not have disabilities work together with the law that was passed by the legislature to address students with IEPs, we're certainly happy to work with those, those districts and clarify any misunderstandings. Who would, who would be the individual that would be contacted at the department to handle such requests if, the, if there is an issue, if there's a breakdown between the it, law and Bessie policy. It would be then, myself or Jamie Wong who works okay. with students with disabilities. Very helpful. Sure. Ms. Holloway, yeah, I think, did you have something or was I it Mr. Do, Garvey? I do, but he had his hand up. Okay, Mr. Garvey. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. Bindley, uh, there was a request to add some more language to, I think, Act, I mean, uh, Bulletin 1566. I, I, I guess that would be a, a repeat of the language that's in 1530. And, and it's a challenge, and, and, and I'll, I'll say we, we try not to repeat or duplicate languages in multiple bulletins because then when one gets changed, you have to remember that it's another right. one. And if you overlook that, then you've got conflicting bulletins. We try not to do that just as a matter of you know, the way that we organize the bulletins. Typically, people do go to Bulletin 1530 uh, to look to that bulletin to guide their actions as it relates to students with disabilities, students with IEPs. So after Act 833 was passed by the legislature in 2014, we felt like that was the most appropriate bulletin to put this in, uh, was the bulletin that those individuals were most familiar with, where they would go. And that information has been in that bulletin for you know, ever since that time. As Mr. Fleming stated, we've also put quite a number of resources on our website. We did trainings, we did webinars, we presented at SEEP, uh, did a lot of communications around Act 833 after it passed. Um, if there are still questions by districts, we're certainly happy, happy to answer those, but nothing has changed with regard to that law. It's been the law since 2014. It remains the law. That language is still in Bulletin 130, uh, I'm sorry, 1530. Uh, that doesn't change, you know, because we're clarifying a provision about a different group of students in a different bulletin. Well, I'm familiar with the potential problems of repeating language in various sections of bulletins. <clears throat> and with that in mind, I was going to ask you if in um, section 1566 you could add something that says C also section 1530. It's in there already. But I think you said you already did that. It's in there, yes. Uh, so that, that solves that issue um, or addresses that issue anyway. Do you have plans or do you have the ability to do more training with these particular districts where problems have been cited? Sure, and I'd be happy to meet with Mr. Fleming or, or some of the other representatives here after the meeting, and if they would give me the name of the district, we're happy to reach out to them and offer any assistance we can. Thank well, you. we have a packet with some districts. So I don't a have a copy, point. but if someone could share that with me, we'd be Ms. happy Davis to Ms. Davis has it, and Mr. Fleming has it as well. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Holloway? Yeah, as a, an overview or a review of trying to figure out where the breakdown is and understanding uh, Bulletin 1566 and also a Act 833. So we um, guide ourselves with these bulletins, am I right, thus far. And then you have a pupil progression plan from the State Department. And it's a template. This template is a guideline. It's minimal requirements for all districts right Correct. so far so am I understanding that um, each the districts uh, Sean thanks for bringing this up to our attention ladies to this uh, good conversation but um, are we saying that the districts don't have the appropriate language in their pupil progression plan or is it the bulletin because I know that every district has the autonomy to build their own pupil progression plan according to the minimum requirements from the state. Is that right? And so, that's why I believe the legislature no longer wished for the state to be in a position to approve these, acknowledging that these are local correct. plans. Because 
needs in his parish or her parish, my parish, are different. And every, so we have, a, we, all three of us, all, actually 11 of us have different plans in all districts. So uh, I was just trying to figure out what was it exactly, that, that where the problem is. Sean, could you maybe answer? Um, you, you know, one, I apologize I did not realize the state no longer looked at people progression plans, and that's mm -hmm. why I was actually kind of surprised, because my first thing would be to tell parents, go look at your people progression plan, and when they, we do that, and it has conflicting information or strange inf information that's not consistent with my understanding of the law, um, or even the template that the department puts out, it just, um, it raised additional concerns. I didn't, and I didn't do not do an exhaustive list. I just pulled a couple of, and shared. So don't think I'm sharing. And the examples, the discussion that occurred um, at the end of last month, from administrators of schools, were from school systems where I could find the references in their pupil progression plan that looked appropriate. So I did not think it was a necessarily a pupil progression plan issue, although in some instances I do think that makes it more confusing to people. Um, I do think when the state stopped using uh, fourth and eighth grade high stakes testing requirements, that it's clear that some administrators believed there were no criteria with which to determine kids eligible for promotion. I agree. Yeah. Because they, they skipped the word local promotion criteria, even in their own plans. They just were not applying that. I mean, that's clear when you read these, these bulleted items. A couple of those are, what grade does this apply? Because they were thinking it was only fourth and eighth grade. And I was like, well, no, that's not. And that, it took me a while to realize what, where their comments were coming from. So that's where the, I think the request is to just have the department share guidance. Because I don't think you can go look through people's people progression plans and guarantee that there's clear understanding in those parishes on, on the application of, of this. I agree. Can I, can I just say to these parents, uh, not that that solves the whole problem, but when you see these things in your pupil progression plan that are clearly um, not understandable and, and kind of conflict one or, you know, one or the other, then I would suggest you go to your special ed director mm -hmm. and call that out because chances are they don't know they don't know it's confusing. Again, I know that doesn't answer the, the whole thing. I, I, I would just say, um, I, I'd ask uh, Ms. Bendeley how we could, because I know there's a, still a lot of uh, issue around 833. Uh, it's just, it, it's, a, it's a, a, I guess, a hard concept to figure out if you weren't in on, you know, as it progressed. How could we, how could we help districts in uh, understanding that a little bit better? And uh, knowing, for instance, when to start about looking at 833, because obviously you don't look at that when you're, I don't think, in elementary school, correct? Well, th this is the third year that that law has been in effect. I so, know. Um, you know, we've done a lot of training on yeah. this. It's I, I, been I in effect that. for a few years. I I'm do. not saying everyone's doing it perfectly, um, but we're happy to push that, push those resources out again, like. Mr. Fleming said they're on our website. We've left them there. We're happy to push them out again through our communications outlets to the districts and also maybe work with the Superintendents Association just to remind them that that information is there and they should be making sure that their pupil progression plans um, align with Act 833 as well. I think that would be very good and possibly if, if you have questions, uh, you or Jamie put your name so that they know that they can call and ask sure. you. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that would be very helpful. Yeah, I would appreciate that. Ms. Holloway. In addition to that, um, Kathy um, and ladies and Sean, uh, we know that every district has a pupil progression committee. And some of us, like I, have served on these committees. And it involves community stakeholders, the district level, there's a chair, parents are involved, and they don't start until a parent's involved in this, or parents and minutes are taken, minutes are in their pupil progression documents. That is on file and have, you can have access to it at any time so you can monitor the discussions that are on hand 
and that's taking place. They don't meet just once, and I don't know if that's a requirement from state level of how many times, but I know it's twice, three times until they've got this document in order. And I, I, I'm going to just applaud Lafouche because I know that they do a lot of studying on this and have it in order, and it's reviewed and reviewed, and then it's presented to the state. Uh, besides that, I would highly encourage you to be a part of that pupil progression in your own district. And they would love to have you because since you have done an in-depth study, um, maybe they may need your attention on certain things like that. So um, please consider that and um, let your district know that. Thank you, guys. Members, are, is there any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Thank you. Your next item is on page 29, item 5.2, consideration of revisions to Bulletin 118, statewide assessment standards and practices relative to statewide assessment and LEAP 2025 United States history performance level cut scores. The department recommendation is to approve as emergency rule and notice of intent. I need a motion. Thank you, Ms. Orange Jones, and a second by Mr. Garvey. I do not believe we have any comment cards on this item. Board members, do you have any questions or concerns? No. Hearing none, motion passes. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 32, item 5.3, consideration of revisions to bulletins in response to legislation of the 2018 regular legislative session. The department recommendation is to approve as emergency rule and notice of intent revisions to bulletins 119, 126, 135, 140, 1706, 741, and 741 non-public. So these are notices of intent and emergency rule for 5.3? Yes, okay. Um, is there a motion? Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Rock. Do we have any comment cards? Okay. Board members, do you have any questions about these? Let me give them a second. There's a lot here, so I'm going to give you a second. All right, board members, is there any, uh, wait, just a second. They're not emergency rules. Do you see, I was leading you there. <laughs> That's okay. So they're not emergency rules, they're just notices of intent. Okay. Yeah, and for the most part, if you look at, if you look at it, it's correcting language and then I think addressing other issues that came out of the session. So, all right. I, you didn't object when it was emergency rule. I'm thinking you're not gonna object now, but I'll give you a chance to do that if you need. Great, uh, hearing no objection, motion passes. We want to go back to item 3.2, but I would like to give an opportunity for our other board members who had to step away to, to hear 3.2. Oh, we have one more item. Go for it. Go yes, okay. Your next item is on page 47, item 6.1, consideration of the summary of public comments and agency response concerning public comments received in reference to the July 20th, 2018 notice of intent regarding bulletin 137, Louisiana Early Learning Center licensing regulations section 1509 policies. The department recommendation is to receive the summary of public comments and agency response, authorize Bessie staff to submit the summary report to the legislative oversight committees, and direct Bessie staff to proceed with the final adoption of the July 20th, 2018 notice of intent regarding revisions to bulletin 137 at the appropriate time. Additional backup documentation has been distributed. 
Do we have any public comment? No, ma'am. Board members, do you have any questions? Do you have any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. So we are going to, I'm sorry. Oh, board members, we need a motion, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Garvey. Thank you, Dr. Thomason. All right, now is there any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. We are going to take a recess. Ms. Davis, do we know how long? No. Yes. Okay. Did you just call me Heather? We're going to uh, tr shoot for a 10 minute recess, board members. Um, I would appreciate it if the department could get set up and ready to do the 3.2 presentation and be ready to roll. What's our next item? Your next item is on page 11, item 3.2 consideration of an update report regarding work keys participation data. The department recommendation is to receive the report and the PowerPoint deck has been placed at your seat. Can I get a motion? Okay. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Davis. And a second by Ms. Edmondson. Superintendent, would you like to start? Sure, and I'll have uh, Ms. Bagian do the presentation. But members, I, I uh, first of all, I appreciate uh, you giving a couple of us time to get back from a meeting. Also, uh, this is a presentation that is gonna be brief, but it responds to a request for information that some of you made about work keys administration. Uh, this was, if you recall, there was a policy two meetings ago that we delayed from the school systems that would have slowed up the frequency of testing on work keys. And so this gives you some indication as to the frequency of testing on work keys. Members, I, I want to draw this, your attention to this in part because I think that it leads to the pretty obvious conclusion that there is some policy that probably needs to be made on this, and uh, therefore we wanted to do a presentation so that you have a sense of what, what is happening. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and I have Dr. Baird with me as well uh, to answer questions. Um, so we started here with just a bit of background. Um, this is a policy the board passed a number of years ago. Um, as you'll remember, um, as the Jumpstart pathways were built from our high school opportunities teams and with um, Jumpstart uh, committees across the state, there was a desire to have students who may be spending their entire latter two years of high school in the workforce to have an additional way or path to show their mastery and expertise of key skills needed to, to engage in the workplace. The ACT organization has an assessment called Work Keys that um, is described as a, a measure of essential workplace skills, is, is often described as more of an applied sort of assessment when compared to ACT. So after a number of discussions many years ago, um, all students take the ACT, but students, um, there was a desire for students pursuing Jumpstart Pathways to be able to also take the work keys. And if they did better on the work keys relative to ACT, as we posited that they might, then the school could be rewarded for their success on the work keys um, as part of the ACT index in school performance scores. Additional pieces of background here. The work keys is an online test. Um, it can be taken at high schools across the state, either under the state contract or through other contracts that are referred to as realms by ACT, which is essentially the district or school has a contract with ACT and they oversee that testing separately. It's also available at adult ed centers, technical colleges, a number of centers and sites across the state, which is different than all of our other statewide assessments. That's why I mentioned that. 
Um, it's most frequently taken by students in grades 11 and 12, but current policy doesn't limit it to that. We count the scores when a student is in grade 12. So their highest ACT or work keys relative to each other is included in SPS when a student gets to grade 12. We fund through state contracts the administration of the work keys for an 11th grade student who is pursuing a jumpstart pathway or diploma. Um, and the school systems cover the cost for testing any additional students beyond that. Um, the test, in addition to being applied, as I described before, results in students earning what ACT calls career readiness certificates. Um, these are platinum, bronze, silver, gold. You'll hear folks refer to these certificates in a variety of conversations. And employers sometimes use them for um, a screen for literacy and numeracy when hiring employees. Um, we also, though, use those certificate levels in accountability. So just as we have an index that says if you get a 35 on the ACT or a 31 or a 25, here's how many points you get. Similarly, if you get a platinum on work keys or a gold or a silver, there are points assigned to that. We refer to this as our concordance table. And just like you'll see colleges compare SAT and ACT scores to see what is comparable in their view, the concordance table is our way and policy of saying a work keys platinum is equivalent to X on the ACT so that we know how to award points and we signal the level of value to our districts with regard to school performance scores. You can see in this chart um, for the past three years um, the number of tests taken uh, by students by diploma type. So again, this was introduced a number of years ago in response to Jumpstart Pathways and the Jumpstart or sometimes referred to as the Career Diploma. What you can see on this chart is um, both increasingly and by a majority that the significant majority of the tests are being taken by students who are not pursuing a Jumpstart Pathway and are often um, Topps University students um, pursuing um, the you know, four-year college path diploma. I will note um, we are still finalizing some additional data from ACT, so there are actually tests not accounted for in 1718 in this chart that we're getting additional information from ACT on, but these are the tests that we know of at this point. I will also note that students, um, there are three sections to the test that roll up into the overall score. So sometimes students only take those three and then they're done. Sometimes students retest on all of them. Sometimes students retest on just a portion a number of times. So it is not 79,000 students. It is 79,000 tests, if that makes sense. And that, that represents different combinations of total tests per student, if that makes sense. Mr. Gardy. Yes, uh, I was under the impression that work keys typically taken by students that were not going the four-year route. It does not qualify you for admissions to any four-year institution. It has nothing to do with going to four-year colleges. However, so at, well, the board, uh, when we created Jumpstart, you recall that that was at the same time that students all started uh, being required to take a free ACT. And so the deal with the school systems that was, was kind of established between the board and some of the leaders of school systems was to say, we'd like to take work keys also, and we'd like you to give credit no matter whether the student was, was on a Jumpstart career diploma or a Topps University if the kid excels. And um, you, you may recall uh, uh, the, the Orchard Foundation in, in Rapides Parish, for example, was talking a lot about how ACT or, or work keys had helped all of their students. So the board uh, permitted school systems to administer this assessment for credit. What it looks like has happened is that over time, kids in some places are literally taking this test every couple weeks. Um, so that, and part of that is that, yes, they get better at taking the test, it drives up results. Um, it also, though, is that they just get more familiar with the test. And they see the same test over and over and over again. 
And therefore, when we said to school systems this year, which is why we're raising this to you, you cannot, we are not gonna count tests that are taken more frequently than once per month. Many, not many, but some of the superintendents said, hey, wait a minute, you're pulling a bait and switch on us. This is too late in the game to, to make that call. And we agreed with them. But we wanted to bring this back to you to show you what the updated data is, because as Jessica's data is pointing out, uh, there's a problem here. This is not the students for whom this assessment was is really intended. Exactly. And secondly, no matter which students it is, you're talking about literally a doubling in the number of tests over a two-year period alone. Uh, and by the way, this is not in many places, or not in most places, it's in some places. This is not a every district is, is experiencing this. This is a some districts are exhibiting this phenomenon. What percentage of districts would you say are contributing to the doubling? Um, I don't know that. I can, I, I can pull exact numbers for okay. you all to update. Okay. Jessica. Um, Miss, Miss Lewis? I have a question. You're saying a lot with your couple, eyes over there, by the way. I have Ms. a Lewis. couple questions. I guess I'm just so confused. So my first question is, so we're paying, the state is paying for these kids to take work keys and one the admission. One time if they're pursuing a jump start pathway, yes. But the blue so section. So who's paying for the multiple attempts? If we the just pay for one time. I have a, if you want me to move forward, just two additional slides, I have this in here, if it's helpful for me yeah, to Yeah, but through. another thing too, so the policy, do we have in our policy for these districts to make sure these kids take either the work keys or the ACT? Because to me, this is alarming. What if we get to a point where the kids who need to take the test and jumpstart, we don't have the funding or the capacity to fund those since we are trying to be a little bit more intentional and ramping up our jumpstart um, participants. This is just concerning to me. I just think we need to have something in policy. If you're not on the jumpstart pathway, you need to take the ACT. I mean, there needs to be some kind of lever or something for us just to be a little bit more, um, I don't know, efficient um, and a better steward of these resources for funding and just a variety of things. So, Thank you, Ms. Lewis. We're going to go ahead and get the rest of the presentation, and then we'll take all of the questions that you guys have. May I just add one thing? Every student that's represented on this graph in the blue, sorry, actually, every student that's represented on this graph, period, is taking the ACT. Yes. And some students here may be taking the ACT multiple times. In fact, if you're, most kids do take the ACT multiple times. So it's not just the work keys uh, that these students are taking, which I think makes Ms. Lewis's point, from my perspective, all the more troubling. It's actually not a cost to the state issue, however, because the number of students that the state is funding every year has actually remained relatively constant. Oh, but, um, the but it's the districts. Yeah. That's, right. yeah. That's a very important point. It's even more troubling. All right, Ms. Bagian? Sure. So what you see on slide four is um, in addition to the uptick in the number of students taking the test across the board, it's also important to know that ACT relatively substantially this year updated the work keys assessment. This is important because it represented a change for our districts, but it's also important from a policy perspective because um, they intentionally updated their scoring criteria. Historically, when you look at platinum, which is the top level that a student can earn on the certificates, less than 1% of students were earning that certificate nationally. Based on their rescaling and scoring, that number is 11.6% nationally moving forward. So, for example, in the past, a platinum has been keyed against a 31 on the ACT. I fully anticipate when we rerun re that analysis, which we will be able to do very soon, it will not be true that the average ACT of a student scoring platinum will be a 31. It will be significantly lower. And this is important from a policy perspective because right now in school performance scores, when a student earns a platinum, we are representing that as having the extremely high and rare value that earning a 31 on the ACT does as part of that concordance table. So I have a note here, you all have in policy the concordance table, there's an opportunity for annual review of that. 
We will have final additional numbers on this as a result of our data certification process underway currently by the October meeting. Um, and I think it is likely that an update uh, to that concordance table from a measurement perspective will be necessary. I have here for you, though, the data on what that current concordance looks like. Um, I also have one final slide that um, captures for you just on the test that happened under our state contract. So to clarify Ms. for Ms. Lewis, these are not all that we pay for. There are some districts that test on our state contract and then basically pay back the state for ease of use, which is helpful logistically for them. But you can see here the, the quantification of how much this has cost just from the state contract over the past three years, keeping in mind that the state is actually funding the yellow bar um, and the $713,000 that are being spent on work keys just for the state contract alone um, this year for work keys um, represents district investment on this um, and for students who are not 11th graders and not on um, a jumpstart diploma pathway because if they were then of course they would be funded by the state. There are additional data to be added here but again we need that through the data certification process to, to have the final numbers for this year but this represents I would, I would suspect the majority of the whole. Mr. Garvey? Yeah, going back to something you said Use your mic, Mr. Garvey. I'm sorry. I thought I had it there. Uh, you said that for a, a child currently, or last year, a child that scored platinum, um, we equated it with a 31 on the ACT. How many points did that generate? Was that 150 or? 134. 134. 134. The max being 150. And what does it take to get a 150? To get a 150, you need a 36. Perfect score. The perfect score. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 36. And to get a, a, a 150 for, don't you get um, points for AP classes? You do, in a different index. So remember, there are four key components to the high school score. There's the EOC index, the ACT index, the graduation rate, and then the strength of diploma, as we call it. The strength of diploma is the index where we look at, in addition to a diploma, did you also take or pass AP? Did you earn a jumpstart pathway, et cetera? These points, if you will, sit within the ACT index where we look at, for grade 12 students, the highest score they earned on the ACT or its equivalent on the work keys. Okay, for the, for the quality of the diploma section, uh, you get 150 points per AP class. If you earn a diploma you and you pass an AP exam with a three or higher, a three that or is higher. correct. Mm -hmm. uh, three, four, or five. Correct. We get you that. Um, the question is, why does it take a perfect score of 36 on the ACT to get 150 points when it doesn't take a perfect score on the AP test to get 150 points? Yeah, this is a discussion we had in a variety of settings as part of the ESSA process. We're happy to revisit it. Um, we did it so that there is a continual incentive across the board to, you know, improve along the way. Um, and it was the way the index was designed from the beginning. Um, but there, there, are, um, there are some who would argue that we should have that capped at a lower level. Well, let me ask you a related question. If you score a two on the AP test, you get zero. You get so unless you somehow otherwise sure. in the earn strength of diploma index. By yeah, taking a college course. We basically say an A or a 100 is a diploma. That's the minimum we want for every child. If you have a diploma plus you have engaged in a more rigorous process, such as taking a dual enrollment course, taking an advanced placement course, and passing those um, courses, then you get a small boost to 110. Um, if you take those courses, those rigorous courses, and you pass the exam, so your your mastery of the content is validated by a third party in that way, that earns the max points of 150. Okay, thank you. Ms. Lewis, you had questions earlier about the um, work keys presentation. Do you have, do you want to go back to those questions where they answered? Um, I guess my concern is, 
I think the accountability system is what's driving these districts to allow these kids to take these tests multiple times. And I don't know, I just get tired of, you know, every meeting, you know, we talk about budgets, how much money they have, you know, on testing, the amount we require them to test. And now here we are, some districts allowing these kids to do testing two and three times not just the cost, but the time that it takes these kids to take these tests. I don't know, that's just concerning to me. And maybe because I'm not there every day, maybe Doris, you can give more insight on this. Um, but it just seems concerning from, from well, just several different points. It just, it, it, it's hard to look at all the different factors when you try to put it in perspective. The ACT index, is that 25% of the school performance score. When this 18 on the ACT used to be 100 points before we changed the scale. So the 18 has now dropped to 70 points. So if you get an 18 on the ACT, it's 70. And then for each point that it goes up on the ACT, it's 3.8, isn't it 3.8 or 3.6? It's 10 to 27 and 100. No, no, but after 21. Yes, it's what, 3.8? 21 is a 100. So 21 is now the new 100 points. And then if you score 22, it's a 103.8. And if you score 23, you add 3.8 to it. So it's very difficult. Usually your ACT index is going to be the lowest score, for the most part, of mm -hmm. all of those four indices, the 25, 25, 25. Because you could have your district with an average ACT score of 21 and still not get 100 points in that index because of the number of zeros you might get behind it. So an average score of 21 does not equate with the 100. All right, so it's very difficult on that ACT index. Uh, the only way you can get 150, you know, every child in three through eight, when you're taking your LEAP tests, score advanced, you get 150. Well, the only way you can get a 150 on the ACT is to get a perfect score of 36. So it's very, very difficult to get those, quote, points. Then the kids who are on the Jump Start Pathways, many of them were not taking, after their first couple of years, were not taking necessarily the English 3 or the Algebra 2 or any of those more advanced. In fact, some were not even taking geometry. So work keys became a consideration for um, while they everyone did take the ACT regardless of your pathway then the jumpstart diploma kids were looking at work keys because from the industry's point of view that was a valid uh, testing I guess uh, assessment but you never could get, I mean, if you look at the 18 right now, which is the silver, the silver gives you 70 points. The gold gives you maybe, um, I was trying to quickly do it, 111.8, 110.2. So if you score gold, you only get 110.2. If you score platinum, you get the 130, whatever it is, 134. So even that you could never score anything other than those three indicators. Now what further complicates things a little bit is that many of our kids are blending pathways. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of Topps University kids now that are interested in some of these Jumpstart pathways that we've been approving. Some of the STEM pathways, even some of the building and construction pathways. Because I could have a kid who is going to a four year university who wants to be an engineer, but he wants, he's, he's taking those electrical courses as well. And then concurrently with that, we encourage all those kids to take the work keys. Now, that doesn't account for all of these, because there are some kids who score high on the ACT that are encouraged to also take the work keys. I don't necessarily do that, but there are some places. But if, I mean, in order to get, um, you know, it, it, platinum only gives you the 130 something, and the gold only gives you the 110 point whatever. So I, I don't look at it as extremely advantageous to have all of those kids, the higher uh, scoring kids, take it. 
but many kids are lending you know, these pathways, which is what we were trying to, to make happen. So if I'm going to a four-year university, we want those kids to explore some of these also, some of these workplace options as well. And concurrently with that, they're taking, they're taking the work keys assessment. So it's, it's not cut and dry. It's not that simple to draw inferences from a small you know, amount of data. That's my opinion. Uh, Dr. Bobby, can I ask yes. a question? Uh, I, I was just Benson. wondering, what's the number equated to the silver, which is where uh, it looks like most of the people? Uh, uh, In yeah, the number, like you were saying. It's 17. 17. 17. 18. An 18 on the ACT or 70 points? 70. 70 points. And that's what the silver gets you. That's Mr. Davis? Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Edmondson, are you finished? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Davis? So uh, a couple of things, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Boshi hit on this. I do want to reiterate that I think it's important for the board to consider that from outside of the school system, this is an assessment that many employers find valuable yes. in reference to hiring. Uh, there are, at the very basic level, an understanding from employers to know that what they see in front of them when a, when a student arrives or a potential employer arri employee arrives with an NCRC, that career rating certificate. Uh, there are some who recommend that. There are some who require certain levels for that for that employment. So on the outside of the academic setting, this is a very important tool. It's been recognized more and more and more on a national level, and certainly in Louisiana. To that point in Louisiana, the numbers you see there, when we see, when we see the 713,000 across the LEAs we have is $10,000 a year. At the, at the end of, I mean, in a, in a multi-million dollar budget, this is, we're not overspending per se on that. And to Ms. Boucher's point about having students who are interested in both sides. And that's something that we need to focus on a great deal and recognize, which we have taken steps to do so by having the dual track type uh, pathways, which we, we just approved two of the last meeting. So we're recognizing that, that occurs more and more, but it's something, something that we really need to keep in mind in a general sense as we prepare uh, kids for what their next move is gonna be. Uh, so I just wanna reiterate that this is an important program, regardless of how we're looking at, certainly in, in relation to how we're looking to, to score it and the accountability points, but this is, this also extends far outside of the academic realm, and we need to keep that in mind uh, for what we're discussing here. Some questions, though, Ms. Magallon, relative to the uh, chart on page four. You're showing the currently there's 11.6 percent of the percentages uh, for platinum, with the and, and previously it was 0.4 percent. Where are those from? Um, work ready. These those are numbers? from ACT. These are the national numbers for ACT for the old and new test. Okay, because the numbers on their website indicate about a 1%, uh, both in Louisiana, so the trend line follows, and the national level over historic trend. And I was always on the impression it was 1%, so I just want to verify the yeah. numbers that come from them. We can triple check platinum. again, but these are the numbers that were provided to us from ACT, and it may just be that it's... And the transition between the two the could, could wait that out. Test. So one last question on that that I would like to see, um, maybe the board would like to see as well, but I certainly would. Uh, for the board's knowledge, there are 10 parishes in central Louisiana. Uh, Superintendent referenced Orchard Foundation earlier. There are 10 parishes in central Louisiana that are considered certified work-ready communities, which means that they have a full system where you have these high school students, which is what our discussion is about today, who hold NCRCs, a certain percentage of unemployed, as well as a certain percentage of employed. And finally, the fourth metric is the number of employers who recognize what that piece of paper is. Uh, that creates a sort of ecosystem for this, uh, for this assessment. I would like to know, relative to that, how the distribution looks for these tests, both in what we're paying for on the state side as well as what the districts are paying for. It. I would have to think that it's probably fairly weighted around some of those parishes, but it may not be because those are generally rural-type parishes, and so the numbers would be offset pretty quickly. But I would be very curious to see how that uh, graphically on a, a per parish on how we're spending with the district versus the state. Uh, and we have other systems that are coming on board with this, just for knowledge as well. There are, I think, five others that are currently pursuing the certification. Sure. Uh, we'll go with uh, Dr. Jones and this Ms. Boche. I just want to echo a little bit of what uh, Mr. Davis just said. Uh, the Rapids Foundation in central Louisiana uh, made a significant investment in work keys, pays for the districts and the uh, students to take those times and numerous times as a part of their uh, community program. So I would think that a very large piece of these probably do, do come out of the central Louisiana uh, piece where the, uh, where the Rapids Foundation has done so much work in that area. Ms. Foshe? I think we have 
begun and I think we have accomplished has been a tremendous marketing job statewide and a tremendous partnership with business and industry uh, with these Jumpstart Pathways and also with this type of, an, of assessment in conjunction with the IBCs. This is really becoming recognized by the business community. Maybe it always has been in education. It was a little bit behind the curve to catch up with it. It's difficult. I do not want to discourage our students from taking this. We're looking at part-time job opportunities. We're looking at if you go, even if you go away to college and you've got some of these credentials, that it is, it's, it's a wonderful part-time uh, job opportunity. And there are many kids who still graduate in a TOPS University pathway because they think it's the thing to do and their parents are pushing them down that road and they quickly find that maybe a four-year university is not for them and if we have given them the exposure to these courses these pathways these certifications based on these assessments we have helped them then to reconsider what their future might be rather than uh, not having anything other than that high school diploma and then starting over. So I think we need to be very careful on how we proceed with this. Now, if we need to do some minor correction somewhere, maybe we can look at it. But I do not want to, I do not want to discourage kids from taking this if it is, especially if it is tied to some coursework that they're taking or some interests that they have. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I think the question is, are there instances where kids are just regularly being cycled through the same test effectively just for the purposes of upping their score by incremental points so as to get their, their school more points? I don't know the answer to that. And I think, you know, maybe that's Ms. Roche to your, to your point. It's not that many more points, Superintendent. I don't think that's involved in it. When you look at, if you have a silver, you get, well, you get 70. To get the gold, you have it, it's 110 or whatever I think is as, as she was saying whatever that number is uh, that equates with the ACT score even if you score a platinum you're not even up to the 150 range I, I don't uh, with the number of zeros that we're giving within that index um you take and I don't even want to say the district's name say you take the, the highest scoring district in our state uh, with AC, an average ACT, I don't know, maybe if their average is a 21, they're not getting 100, forget the work keys, mm -hmm. they're not getting 100 points on the um, ACT index with an average score of 21. They're getting much lower. So I, I don't think we're looking at tremendous inflation here on the ACT index. Oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm not worried about the inflation. I'm, I'm just worried about are there places where kids aren't going to class but they're going to the testing lab? That, and I, maybe we just need to do more looking. I agree, I, this is not, from my perspective, the importance of this data, really it doesn't drive, as Ms. Boshi is saying, no, massive change in the accountability system. I it, so. it is, I think the question is, is there incentives just to test and test and test? And I think that for a couple of reasons. One, it's online. Two, it's low cost. You know, it's less than 10 bucks a kid. So, it, you know, we're not talking about big bucks here. And three, it's really fast. You know, you just get kids in, you get them out. It's not a long test. So I think we should take a look place by place and just agree to keep talking to the board. One reason that we did want to raise this is that um, Ms. Bagian is right, that because the ACT changed the form and the scoring, we have to go back and look at it because literally they've had, there are now 25 times the number of platinum winners that there were under the under the policies that were assumed by the board before. I think we do need to look at that. But I, I, I take the point. We need to proceed with caution. And I, do, I agree with Ms. Voshe. I don't want to discourage anyone from taking the test. So Personally, I think we need to look at the scoring on the whole ACT index because it's very low. So. Dr. Jones? Uh, and I just want to clarify a little bit. Of, you know, I, I think in central Louisiana, for example, in those 10 parishes, they do encourage those kids to take the test multiple times because the employers there have bought into that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the employers are hiring kids off of the scores they're getting on those. And so the district encourages, the Rapids Foundation pays for it because it also sees a connection between workforce ready and, and, and the uh, 
uh, value of em employees and employers in the district. So, you know, I, I, I don't personally see anything wrong with it if they take, uh, the kids are not, to my knowledge, are not missing classes to any significant amount of time to take that. But they, are, they do encourage kids to take it, take it multiple times. Uh, and I think their original concern was that when we passed the thing that said that they wouldn't be able to take it for 30 days after they took it the first time, the fact was that it was the short notice that they, that they got on it that was a concern, not the, not the issue about whether or not they couldn't take it again uh, before 30 days had elapsed. But I, I've seen nothing but good things come out of the Work Keys program. John, you accused me of working for ACT one time on that, but I, <laughs> I, I didn't really. I just know that, that uh, uh, you know, it, it does provide a, a viable option. And the other thing I, I, would, I would ask the question is, what percentage of our kids score a 31 on the ACT? About a 36. <laughs> not, not a high percentage. Okay. And, 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 and so yeah, if 11% uh, of the new ones will score that under platinum, that's 11 percent nationally, right? It is, yeah. Yeah, that's not 11 percent of Louisiana. It demonstrated numbers here are 1 percent by work ready communities reporting. Yeah, so, so we it's have not to reconcile it's, our department with that, but right, it's not going to change. I doubt for the for the near future that it's going to change significantly the number of kids that that uh, uh, get ACT points of 31 because we're not we're not having that many scores. So out. so why don't we do this? Why don't we go back and just look place by place and see if there's some exaggerated contributor to it? And we can just keep talking about it. I, I take the points around caution. I also take the points that it's not a huge contributor to the system's outcomes. Um, I just want to make sure that there are not places where I think this should caution us. I think that Rapids has been doing this for for years, and I think yeah. that is baked into the 40. What's what's unclear to me is why over a two year period has the number of test takers doubled? Is that because just statewide there's more access, or is it because a couple of places are doubling down and going really, really big? Flags were raised for us when we said it wouldn't count but once every 30 days, and people said, hey, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. That's a, and, and it was said at the superintendent's council, that's a big deal against my SPS, which to me and to us indicated that there were people who were saying this is a big contributor to my SPS strategy, but I, I take the point. That's probably few and far between if it, if it exists at all. So if you wouldn't mind, we'd like to go back and look at that, and we'll uh, be back to the board on it. There's also the, the question of the non-LDOE um, realms and getting that data to have a more complete picture of what's going on here. So I um, one note I made is the data by region, so understanding the region, and I think the superintendent took that a step farther in thinking about if there's like one area that's contributing to this or not. But I'm also, I'm really interested in the, this, the way I understand what you said is that we have the data from which is connected to the Department of Education's contract. I'm curious about what else is happening and how, how that looks. So um, it seems like it's a conversation that we'll continue to have. And just, just, one, yes. just one final statement. The nature of the high school student you take a 16 or 17 year old and you talk, you tell him, I want you to keep taking this and taking this and taking this and taking this because I want your score to get better. He's not going to do, unless it's a benefit to him or her, they're not going to do any better. They're going to balk at something like that. I mean, you know, kids are not, they're not going to sit there in a continuous testing cycle and say, oh, just give me more and let me do it again and again and again because you ask me to, to try to better this, they're looking at what, what value do I them. get? Yeah. What value do I get yeah. from it? Mm -hmm. And if it is a val if it's valuable to them in terms of an, a job or if that community that we, I mean, we've done a tremendous job, I think, statewide in the last two years, like Mr. Davis is, was saying, in marketing this out there to the business community and holding hand in hand with it, I just don't want to jeopardize any of that in any way and I really don't think it's being abused and misused because the kids themselves would walk at a continuous taking of something if they don't feel it's beneficial for them. Uh, yes, Ms. Edmondson. Yes. Uh, the 30 days, is that, are we implementing that? Is that something that you yes. said was for this, for this year. So for this year, you can only take it once every 30 days. For it to count, yeah. For it to count, okay. And, um, for it to count in the state 
accountability system. Now, if the child wants to take it more often and um, create, a, you know, earn a, potent, a credential that they right. can use, it's that's their but prerogative. The, the, the best score is used. The limitation to the school target. performance okay. Okay. That's score. Why. Because I, I want to echo what Gary and uh, and Doris were saying. I, I I agree that kids are being encouraged to take it more than once because they probably will better their score. I, I, I agree too. No kid's going to sit there and take it over and over, but I think there's a buy-in uh, for the parish and for the student. So, you know, kids just don't do as well the first time, and uh, I, I think that, I know in my parish that's, that's a big, big issue that they, they try again and they do a little bit better and maybe a third time a little bit better, and that's important to them. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Yes, Dr. Jones. This will be my last one, I promise. I think one of the things that we have to take into account here is what the effort of the kid is who's trying to improve their score. We benefit when that kid goes back and studies and does other things and tries to, to better themselves. They're not just going in there and taking the test over and over again. They're making some effort in between to, so that they'll do better. So I think, I, I don't think there's any losers in that situation in that ultimately the kid probably will do better on their, on their ACT as well because of the, 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 the practice that they're getting and the remediation that they've got to give themselves in order to do better. So I would say though that if our high school school performance scores are um, inflated, then there are losers in our system if we don't have people focused on increasing the instruction, increasing the opportunities for kids. So I, I, um, I understand what you're saying about the individual student and the credential there. I feel that, um, and this is talking to practitioners, who are focused at the elementary and the middle school level and their focus is in on instruction and continuing to improve that instruction but don't necessarily get that same perspective across the board from high schools. So, and I, I, think, I think our kids are losers in, in that situation. But in high school, and our accountability system is definitely different in high school than it is in elementary and middle school. Well, you'll see a drop in the scores this year with the new standards. Well, so why don't we get more information? We'll keep the dialogue going. Any objection? Hearing none, motion passes. This concludes our agenda. Oh, Ms. Voce, I recognize you um, oh, because um, you are recusing yourself on 2.1. 2 .1. Yes, ma'am. Okay. This concludes our agenda, and I believe we'll start our retreat in about five minutes. <laughs>